Hello and welcome to today's Welcome Webinar Series, part of our GROW program. I'm Stephanie Stiltner, I'm the Director of Family Connections, and I'm a member of our GROW team. Today we're here with faculty from our College of Nursing and Human Services, and we're going to talk about our nursing programs and our social work programs. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to our Dean, Karen Dameron. Okay. Welcome. My name is Karen Dameron. I'm the Dean of the College of Nursing and Human Services. I've been at the University of Pikeville. This will be my 22nd year. I just finished 22 years at the University of Pikeville. I um, just finished my third year as Dean of the College of Nursing and Human Services. We've been the, um, the College of Nursing and Human Services includes both the nursing programs and the social work programs. Um, I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. I have been in Pikeville, Kentucky for 27 years. So it feels like home. I still call El Paso my home home though. When, it, when somebody says home, that automatically pops into my mind because that was where I did all my growing up. I've got my first nursing degree at the University of Texas in El Paso um, back in 1983. I have a master's degree from Bellarmine University and then I have my PhD from the University of Kentucky. Um, my background in nursing is in um, obstetrical nursing and um, uh, neonatal intensive care unit. And I worked at a couple of neonatal in intensive care units in Texas and then also in Portland, Maine. Um, when I was faculty here at the university before I became the dean, I was the OB instructor and the pharmacology instructor. I still teach the pharmacology course in the second year. And I also um, teach a uh, uh, NCLEX, which is the uh, licensing examination um, preparation course uh, just prior to graduation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the um, division chair of the associate degree nursing program, Donetta Markham. Hello, everyone. My name is Donetta Markham. Um, I've worked at the university for um, 16 years now, starting on my 17th year. Um, I've been named the chair of the division. This will be my second year at that. Um, I teach in fundamentals one and two. I've been a nurse for 31 years. Um, I first got my degree, um, associate degree, at the um, Southern West Virginia Community College in Williamson, West Virginia. I then got a bachelor's degree at West Virginia um, University Institute of Technology, a master's degree at University of Phoenix, and I'm presently working on a doctor of nursing practice degree through Northern Kentucky University and I'm scheduled to graduate in May of 2021. Um, I have three children, um, lived in this area all my life, um, married for 30 years this coming um, September, and just welcome you all for any questions and welcome to the University of Pikeville. I'll now pass it on um, to um, Tanya Goley, who is our um, chair of the RN to BSN program. Thank you, Donetta. I'm Tanya Goley, chair of the RN to BSN program. Um, I haven't been here quite as long as most of the folks, so I'll be the baby of the faculty. Uh, the young, well, maybe even the youngest, maybe not. Anyway, um, I did my uh, AD degree, associate degree at Mountain Empire Community College. I finished there in 1992, and I went to Radford's first MSN FMP program, and I finished there in 1998. So I've been a practicing nurse practitioner for 20 years. Uh, greater than 20 years. I finished in 1998 and I'm in the clinic today. So as to keep certification as a family nurse practitioner, you have to practice. So I'm in the clinic today and you can see we've got lots of samples back here and hopefully this Metamucil won't come alive back here on me. So uh, if I'm out in the clinic, I have to be wearing my mask. So I've been allowed to sit in here without it so I can talk to you folks. Um, after completing my family nurse practitioner MSN program, I went to East Tennessee State and finished my PhD in nursing in 2010. So, um, I'm the chair of the RN to BSN program and we, uh, have, uh,
graduate 17 students. Everybody's 100% online. Most of the students have went full-time, and full-time means you can finish in three semesters beginning in fall, spring, and then summer. Um, we have 30 credits that must be completed that are required for the uh, baccalaureate degree. And we also require 120 total credits for the baccalaureate degree. We do have practicum requirements and they begin in the spring with the community course and then they continue on into the summer. So uh, we're really excited to uh, welcome you all to the University of Pikeville. If you have any questions, please contact me. My information's in the chat. And I'll turn next to Ashley Newsom, our simulation coordinator. Hello, I'm Ashley Newsom. Um, as she said, I am the simulation uh, coordinator. Um, simulation is, um, we've been doing it for a few years. It uh, pertains to working with mannequins and um, live models. Um, it just depends on what our scenario is. We've got several. Um, students tend to like it because it kind of connects the classroom with the uh, clinical setting. Um, we bring the students into what we call the sim lab and they um, we give them like a certain scenario that I and the faculty sit down together and feel like we want to kind of test their knowledge on. Um, so it could be like safety or pediatrics or whatever and the students go in and they act as the real nurse and um, they just take care of their patient and we uh, we don't give a grade on it but um, it's just kind of um, for um, our information but um, that's what I do I'll also be teaching a uh, nurse 100 in the fall and um, that is a new class that we'll have with um, the traditional BSM program um, a little bit about my background I have been with UPIC since 2017 um, I have done clinical adjunct and I've also been a nursing instructor I've taught psych skills um, and then I've got my ADN from Hazard, my BSN from ETSU, and my master's from um, King University. Um, I plan to get my doctorate someday, but after my two babies get into school. And that's all I have. And um, welcome. And I will send you to Dr. Mary Simpson. Mary, you're muted. <laughs> That's like the uh, the shame of the shame of Zoom is to stay muted. So thank you for that. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I've been um, an adjunct uh, 1997, and then uh, adjunct for a few years, and then chair slash dean of the program about 17 years. And I have transitioned over to full time faculty, and have loved it, and have worked with all everyone here and uh, primarily teaching um, fundamentals of nursing and then with some transitions courses and then I'll be working on some special projects this year. Um, I'm from Connecticut originally, Western Connecticut State, and I came down to work at the Appalachian Regional Hospital chain in the late 70s and way leads on to way and this has been home, met my husband here and um, uh, have a stepdaughter and then plenty of stray animals that we take in because I live up a holler in Hardy, Kentucky and animals and things just tend to gravitate if you leave any food out. So um, foster parent to several uh, strays, uh, rescue animals that are here. Um, I'm also on the board at Pikeville Medical Center and I enjoy that to speak for, I'm the only nurse, registered nurse on the board and then can speak to the needs of nursing, uh, both from a faculty perspective and even an exciting time to be in um, and kind of fundamentals uh, on that area. So um, again, welcome and thank you for being here and hope you're still getting to enjoy some of your summer. And I'll pass it on to then another nursing person, Tansy Hall. And I will mute now. <laughs> and I will unmute. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Tansy Hall. Uh, this is my third year at the University of Pikeville. 
Um, I teach med surge 230 and 240 and also do the clinical some of the clinical portion of that as well. Um, I'm from Knox County. I've been from Knox County ever since I've been born. Um, I won't tell you how long that's been. <laughs> Um, I do have a daughter that is, will be 32 in December, and she uh, teaches elementary education um, English uh, for 7th and 8th grade. She's been doing that for about mm, six or seven years now. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned all the critters, Mary, because um, this morning I spent my morning um, cleaning up um, a bear, like ravaged my big metal garbage bin. So uh, I was picking up garbage in the middle of the road this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, I didn't mean to leave food out for that one, but yeah, um, they've seen it a few times. It's got in a few garbage bins um, and uh, it's tore them up pretty good. So uh, we have a big, big bear around here. So um, need to watch out for that, like especially when we go to our vehicle at night and things like that. But um, I obtained my, I was an LPN first. Um, I obtained my LPN from uh, Hazard Community, Community and Technical College. That's also where I uh, received my associate's degree as well. And I received my, um, I did RN to DMP through Frontier Nursing University. Um, and I've been, I practice as an, an FMP, a family nurse practitioner for about three or so years before coming to the University of Pikeville. Um, I received my doctorate thereafter uh, from Frontier Nursing University as well. Um, let's see. What else? Hmm. Um, I think I think that's about it for me. Yeah, yeah. I've just done teaching here for about three years. Worked as an FMP. My doctorate from um, from there as well from um, the uh, Frontier Nursing. And um, exciting time, like I said, like Mary said, a uh, very exciting time especially not knowing what our future holds for this. So uh, kind of scary and exciting all at the same time. So um, I will turn it over to who else is on here. Let's see, Beth. Beth, are you on here? You can only see so many at the top. Okay. Hi, I'm Beth Sullivan and I am a nursing instructor or this portion of that and then also for nursing 125 which is family nursing that's your OB course um graduated from um with my ADN in 2005 um and worked in uh, obstetrics then um, until about 2012 whenever I graduated with my master's and nurse practitioner from Frontier Nursing University. And I've still continued to work as a nurse practitioner um, since then, but I started with the college um, or with the university about five years ago, and I've been teaching and working um, as a nurse practitioner ever since. have two kids and husband who's football coach at Pikeville. So some people who are coming straight out of high school may know him. Um, I think that's about all. Alrighty, I think that's it for our nursing faculty. So let's go ahead. Um, we have two social work faculty with us. So let's go ahead and introduce them and then we'll open it up for questions just in general. Is that okay? So Dr. Carol Gore Bowling, please. Hey everybody, I am Janessa Kilgore Bowling. I am the chair of the School of Social Work and the MSW program director. And the, the chair or the School of Social Work is, of course, within the College of Nursing and Human Services, and it holds two programs. That's our undergraduate program in social work, which is probably of most interest to the students we have here with us today, and also um, the first graduate program in the College of Nursing and Human Services. We've only been here a year and we've already got a graduate program going. So um, that's really exciting. We're accepting our first class this fall. Um, I have been at the university about 16 years now. I think I'm going into my 16th year. It's hard to believe I've been here that long, but the majority of my life actually, adult life anyway, has been up on the hill because I am actually an alum of the university way back when it was Pikeville College. Um, 
with that being said, I want to go ahead and share. Student. So if that is something that um, you're coming into college as also being a first generation college student, know that there are a lot of us on the Hill that are first generation college students. And so we can relate, we can understand and empathize with those fears and those needs. And um, we sort of specialize in that. Um, let's see, I completed, I, I think I told you already, I can, I'm an alum. So my undergraduate degree obviously was from um, Pikeville College, but I that was not in social work. We didn't have a social work program at that time. So my undergraduate degrees are in psychology, human services, and in communication. Yeah, I was one of those kids that had a triple major. Uh, my master's degree and my doctorate is from the University of Kentucky. Uh, my practice experience has been all over the place. I've worked with statute mandated sex offenders. I've worked with juvenile justice. Um, then some uh, medical social work with hospice. And that's the beautiful thing about social work is that, um, especially with an undergraduate degree in social work, your skill set and your knowledge base um, and your value set is so varied that you are able to work with um, a lot of different populations and a lot of different job settings. I always tell our students that if you can imagine a job, you could probably put a social worker in that position. Obviously not nursing or some things like that where you have to have some of those special skills. I could just see Mary saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Janessa, you're not gonna come and work with me. Um, but um, there's, if there's a human service related position, you could probably put a social worker in that position, an undergraduate level social worker in that position and there'd be no problem. Um, with that said, I think, that, oh, let me tell you just a little bit more personally about me. I have um, three kids, I have a, 17 year old young man heading into his senior year. I can't believe I'm going to have a senior. And then I have nine year old twins who are going into fourth grade. So it's pretty busy here at our house. And I'll just go ahead and tell you that if you ask me a question and you hear some banging or hammering or construction work going on in the background, I'm not torturing anybody. I promise we're just having some work not done on our home. So that's my disclaimer if you hear some some strange noises behind me. Um, our undergraduate program director, Professor Ashton Bartley, wasn't able to be with us um, today, but I know that um, she's here in spirit with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this over to our director of, or coordinator of undergraduate field education, Professor Shauna Kelly. Uh, I, I am Shauna Kelly Blair, um, and I teach in the undergrad social work program, and I also serve as a program's um, field coordinator. Um, I'm originally from Letcher County um, and also um, an alum. I received my undergraduate degree in social work in 2011 from um, formerly Pikeville College, now UPIC. Um, I received my master's from the University of Kentucky in 2013. Um, I served as an and officially become full-time faculty last August. Um, so I was able to come home and have an opportunity to serve students in our area. Um, some of the courses that I do teach is our Intro to Social Work course. Um, I will also in the fall be teaching professional ethics um, and our practice course with groups. Um, in the past, I've also taught our communities and organizations course, um, medical social work, and um, some special topics um, such as a trauma course that I taught in the spring. Um, and we welcome questions, so please make sure to put those in the chat or pop in and we'll be glad to answer those. And I will turn it back over to Stephanie. Alrighty, thank you for those introductions and I'm glad you mentioned Ashton because I want to make sure we gave her a shout out and let her know she was included today too. So um, I'm watching the chat if anybody has any questions. Um, I know you do because there's I have questions. Um, this is an, is an amazing group and um, you can tell when faculty really really know their stuff and they're really comfortable comfortable in their field because they speak in acronyms and numbers. So I heard a lot of ADN, RN, BN, BSN, MP, DPN, BR549, all kinds of things. <laughs> so I know I know what those mean just because I've been around you guys for two decades. Um, so let's just let's just start. Do you do you let's just start with the nursing straight up from the beginning? Start at the very beginning on some of those programs and what we offer. So Karen, do you care to kick us off with that? Yeah, I'd like to clarify what we offer. 
different than the nursing program since I just sort of focused on our associate degree program, which is a 70 hour program that is completed in two years. Um, it doesn't have any prerequisites other than that you meet the criteria that when you apply, you were in our top 60 candidates. Um, our criteria includes a, an ACT composite of at least 19, um, high school GPA, you know, or college GPA over 2.0. Um, and then, uh, you know, meeting, we have other points. You can get points for uh, biology classes, grades that you get in that. And then if you're in the top 60 candidates, we take 60 in a class, then you will be accepted into the class each year. Uh, that program is 36 years old. It has, um, it has, uh, so it's been around for 36 years. We just graduated our 36th class and beginning our 37th year, uh, 37th year of the associate degree program. So that's the two-year program. You heard uh, Dr. Gully talk about an RNBSN program. The RNBSN program that we have that is 100% online is a post-licensure program, meaning that to be a student in that program, you have to already be licensed as a registered nurse. You lack a baccalaureate degree. So these are nurses that either have a diploma in nursing, which is unusual now. There's not very many or an associate degree in nursing, and they want to get their baccalaureate degree, they can complete their degree in a program such as the RNBSN program. Brand new this year, we're offering it as the major this fall, is a traditional BSN program. It is a four-year program, and we are beginning to offer the first and second year, well, the first year of the program this year. Um, so somebody who wants to do a four-year BSN from the very beginning would be able to start with Nursing 100 and follow the traditional uh, tr traditional curriculum for a four-year BSN program. This program has not been marketed yet very heavily at all because we're just finally now getting all of our, um, uh, what am I trying to say, uh, okays from different entities, meaning it, we, we got okayed by the Kentucky Board of Nursing. We had to go through the curriculum with the faculty. We had to go through the Kentucky Council of Post-Secondary Education. So getting all those things in place took a while, but we are beginning to start to offer the first year of the curriculum this year. Um, the plan is to offer the two-year degree for one more cycle, meaning that we'll accept one more class is the plan um, before um, discontinuing that program, um, which that would be, we'll be, we'll be taking one more, one more year application for that. So if you're interested in doing a two-year associate degree program and you're not already accepted as a nursing major, we will be accepting one more class. Um, with a March 1st deadline for that. We won't be starting to accept clinical students to the four-year program until those clinical courses won't start until the fall of 2022. So the first class that we would graduate with the new four-year program would be in 2024. Okay, so the associate degree program is still here. It's here to stay for at least another year, possibly more, just depends. Um, but I wanted to just let you know that we do have now a brand new BSN traditional major, although we don't have any clinical courses in that yet. Um, so our ADN and our traditional BSN program are pre-licensure programs, and then the RNBSN is post-licensure program. So I hope that clears stuff up. Thank you. Um, let's see. What about what about pre-nurse? Oh, she's got a phone call, so let's just hold on. Well, we can jump over to um, you, Dr. Markham, if you, want, if you want to answer this one. Or soon to be Dr. Markham, so sorry. Um, do you, what about pre-nursing? We know a lot of students come in and they know they want to do nursing. They're, they're not accepted in the program. What does it mean to major in pre-nursing? Stephanie, I'm sorry, you completely bleeped out. I didn't hear your question. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Okay, so what does it major to be? We've, we've had a lot of pre-nursing students on, pre-nursing majors on campus. So what does it mean to be a pre-nursing major? 
Who's their advisor? All pre-nursing um, students are um, scheduled under Dr. Dameron for pre-nursing advising. Some of those also meet with student success and they register them during the first year, but we work closely with them. But um, as far as who their advisor is, um, I, Dr. Dameron is usually listed on all pre-nursing. And with some of the um, pre-nursing um, areas, you're really free, um, like both what Dr. Dameron said and Ms. Mark Romero, uh, there's not really any prerequisites to applying to the two-year program. So you're free to come to you take any of the courses other than nursing, uh, get some sciences out of the way. So those are the ones we'll call pre-nursing. It's just looking at what courses are required. Take any of those uh, in certain order other than the nursing courses themselves. I had posted a question there just in some of the started response, just for those of you logged in today, the students, I was wondering which of you have already been accepted and which of you might be just thinking about applying to nursing. Um, kind of, maybe we could all kind of look at the side chat here. Sydney's been accepted. Yep, and Jessica and Kelly and Patrick and Brock. So we've got several that are coming in right now. So that's great. Okay. We have a question straight off the bat about the grading scale. Um, who can in for the nursing program? How how does that vary from traditional? We know 90, 80, 70, 60. How how does nursing vary from that? I can go ahead and answer that. Um, and it's common in nursing programs to have a different grading scale than other majors. And we've found over the years that this grading scale helps us to, you know, graduate students who are going to be successful on a licensure exam because we do have a licensure exam ex at the end of the program. So um, in our grading scale, an A begins at 92. So actually a 91.5 rounds up to a 92 at the end, you know, when all is said and A B would be anything from 84 to 91.49, um, actually 83.5 to 91.49, because 84 is a B. And then a 76 or a 75.5, which would round up to a 76, to an 83.49 would be a C. Um, anything below a 76 is not passing. So we do require at least a 76 to pass the courses with a C or a better. Um, we do, if you uh, are unsuccessful in a nursing course, then you get one retry. And that's through the entire program. So it's not like you can't, you can't be unsuccessful in fundamentals and then retry it and do okay and then be unsuccessful in med surge, for example. So it's just one retry through the whole program. Hopefully that has um, clinical and um, skills labs are, are on a satisfactory, unsatisfactory basis. It's not a letter grade. Okay. And that's all explained in that first week of school. You'll have a, uh, you'll have a, um, uh, orientation session that you'll you'll go through the student handbook and learn all the policies that are um, original unique to the nursing program okay. well good and that's good to hear from me even though I have no plans of taking a nursing class I sympathize with several nursing students and I love many of them so even hearing you talking about down to the tenths place or the hundredths place on points. I was like gritting my teeth and, curl and curling my toes because it, it does come down to that sometimes. I know it does. Yeah, it does. And we don't, we, we, we use raw scores all until, all, up until the very, very end. We don't round anything through the entire semester. So each test is not rounded down or up. It's just your, your score is, your, you know, what's, what's documented. And then at the very end um, is when we do our rounding. Because it's either it, up or down. And just like you said, which is a very important point, because um, the grading, it's for the, the grading system and the grading scales for the benefit of the students directly. There's no, yes. because any fluctuation in that doesn't benefit at all when you have to go for a licensure exam. 
Right. And, and it, it's very common in schools of nursing yeah. to have a, 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 an, an elevated scale, so to speak. Elevated. That's a good Elevated one. scale. That, yeah. that's, that, that's a nice way to put that. That sounds... <laughs> Is social work, are yours, um, how's your grading scale? We use a traditional um, grading scale. So it's the 90 to 100, 80 to 89, that sort of thing. So we use a traditional grading scale. Well, Janessa, while we have you, go ahead and introduce the undergraduate program a little bit in more detail. I know you did in your introduction. Oh, no. But wait, 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 you froze up. Say that again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, while we have you, go ahead and introduce, go back and talk a little bit more and expand out about the undergraduate program of social work. Because um, I think we, we, you and I have talked about this just on a casual level, that we're seeing more and more social workers in even like their school nurses, they'll have school social workers or case workers, even in businesses where they have, um, maybe they offer health services or mental health counseling. Sometimes there's social workers that employers will provide. So I, I don't know if that's a new area or if it's just new to me, but, um, and then talk about debunking some of those myths. We talk about social work myths all the time. Nursing, we kind of have a picture for that, you know, because nurse, you can be a nurse on, um, you know, dress up as your future profession day in fourth grade. What do you want to be when you grow up? You know what a nurse looks like nurse looks like right there's you know you have those things with the scrubs and the stethoscope but we don't know what a social worker looks like social worker looks like so talk about that's a whole that's a whole separate webinar is debunking those myths and what it looks like i know but just give us the cliff notes version if you have such a thing absolutely i'll do my best so the the undergraduate social work program is about 14 years old we have been fully accredited by the Council on Social Work Education, and we offer a, um, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about a BSW, and that's a Bachelor of Social Work. Um, at UPike, we offer a BASW or a BSSW, and that just ties back into the liberal arts tradition, whether you get a Bachelor of Arts degree or a Bachelor of Science degree. And um, there's no difference at all in the degree. They're the same thing. We just call them something a little bit differently. Um, with our undergraduate degree in social work, once you graduate, you are eligible for licensure as an LSW in the state of Kentucky, and that varies from state to state. So if you're watching and you're not a Kentucky person, I would, I would um, you know, explore what my state's requirements are. But most states offer some sort of licensure or certification on the undergraduate level. And um, that, that undergraduate program is actually the, um, what we call um, educating our students from a generalist perspective. And when I was talking earlier about this idea that you can take an undergraduate social worker and if you could imagine a human services position, you could put them in it and they could be successful. And that's basically what that, that generalist approach does. Generalist is all about um, providing that, that general knowledge base, those general skills that, that prepare our students to work with um, individuals, families, groups, communities and organizations, um, and even on a societal level. And to tackle, you know, any problem. They could work with policy making, they can work in, in mental health under supervision, they can work in schools as school social workers, can work in our criminal justice system. Shauna, please feel free to, to jump in and add to some of those. I mean, there's a lot of different areas. Um, of course, a lot of folks think that um, traditional social workers are only child protective service workers, and that's kind of where we get into the stereotype. Um, interesting fact is that most of your social workers that you see in um, child protective services, a lot of them, not most of them, but the I would, I would be sure to say in Kentucky, the majority of them, just because there's so few social workers, and that's true across our nation, the majority of them are social service workers. And the difference there is that a social service worker does not have a social work degree. So they don't have the same training. They have um, training in a related field. It could be psychology, it could be sociology, criminal justice, or something like that. But their degree is not in social work. And actually in our state, we have title protection, which means they are even not supposed to call themselves social workers because you have to have the degree or the license in order to be considered a social worker in Kentucky. So that's a lot of that is where our stereotypes come from. 
is the fact that folks don't realize that um, not all of those social workers or those people that introduce themselves as social workers to them actually are social workers. They actually have a degree in something else. They weren't trained in the same streets perspective or a person in the environment perspective um, that social workers were. And, and you're right, there are a lot of stereotypes associated with it, not just that we lovingly refer to it as baby snatching. Um, fun fact, social workers don't remove children from homes. A judge does that. We just take custody and make sure the kid is safe if we're working in that CPS uh, kind of approach. Otherwise, we're probably not even involved with, with any sort of, of, of child protective services if we're not working in those sort of agencies. Um, let's see, other stereotypes that you'll see about is that um, all social workers are um, women. And while we are predominantly a female, um, um, based profession. There are a lot of, of, of gentlemen in our profession and um, and they do very well. I think because social work is considered to be such a, a caring, empathetic, um, very many times people call it an altruistic profession, that they don't see that as being masculine, but that is absolutely not the case. And in fact, some of the best social workers that um, I have as colleagues are our male social workers. So um, what else, Shauna, help me out here. Um, it seems to be that the pay is not very well for social work. So maybe we can talk about that. <laughs> That's one for sure. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, social workers are, are not paid very well. And, um, and while I will agree that I think that, that most people who are in a some level that is absolutely not the case with social work particularly if you um if you have the degree in social work you are much more sought after rather than someone who has a related degree um in addition if you decide to go on to get that master's degree in social work it substantially increases your earning potential um and the great thing about um, an undergraduate degree in social work is that um, if you have a degree from an accredited, a CSW accredited undergraduate program, you can enter into a master's degree program in something we call advanced standing, which means that you can get your master's degree in about half the number of hours. Typically it's between 30 and 35, as opposed to doing a full um, regular standing program which is what else Shauna help me out here there's so many stereotypes I don't even know which ones to hit there are so many um, aside from aside from that CPS um, role a lot of times people think that you can work beyond that but they think that we only work with children and families um, so I know that we kind of touched on we can work in communities and organizations but maybe we could talk a little bit more about that yeah you want to hit on some of those other places I hit on a few absolutely I know that you mentioned um, that you had worked um, for hospice before. I also have worked for hospice. Um, I have worked um, for Voc Rehab, um, so working with adults with disabilities, uh, definitely in addictions and substance use. Um, one of our practical placements that we have is with our West Care Jail Recovery Program. Um, one of the, another practical placement that you wouldn't typically think about as having a social worker um, is Girl Scouts. So we have a practical placement with them, and we have um, the state training coordinator for Girl Scouts is actually a social worker. Um, I know a lot in the criminal justice field, a lot of and probation and parole, we have a lot of social workers working in that. Um, people typically don't um, see a social worker working there um, in jail programs, prison programs. It's, it's actually across the lifespan. Um, even when you think about medical social work, um, we work a lot with our nursing colleagues and in, 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 in physicians in hospitals across the lifespan from the NICU from right after delivery up into the point of, of, you know, maybe palliative care or even hospice care. So it is truly across the lifespan. So it's any population targeting any sort of problem, really. Um, one of the things I do want to talk about real quick before you switch over to some other questions is um, our practicum or field education component. That's actually considered the, the signature pedagogy of social work. And for our undergraduate students um, in their last semester, they um, are placed in an agency where they will work. They will actually carry a caseload. That's why it's called a practicum. 
shadow. You actually get to work with the clients hands-on. In fact, we require that uh, in our placements, much like nursing would do. You can't be a nurse without having some hands-on um, experience. And it's the same way with social work. So our students will complete 400 hours in the field under a qualified supervised, uh, supervisor, which is usually um, someone else who has the social work um, degree, either undergraduate with two years experience or the MSW with a couple of years experience. So they actually, you know, do get to go out and try out those those skills that we've been teaching them about and to test that knowledge base and apply their values. Um, and ethics to an actual practice setting. Shauna, um, like I said before, is our coordinator of undergraduate field education. So she is actually the, the field education guru and helps you to find a placement that's appropriate for you, um, helps to make sure that your supervisor is qualified and that you set appropriate learning goals and just sets you up with everything. Um, it makes the process as user-friendly, um, student-friendly as possible. Perfect, perfect. You guys are hitting all the notes, all the things that I wanted to make sure we covered. I'm just checking the list, so my job's easy. I'm just kind of sitting back here on cruise control today. So um, one thing I did want to mention, um, we have a nursing faculty, another one, Connie Workman, who couldn't join us. So Dean Dameron, do you care to introduce her and, and kind of tell what she um, instructs, and then I'll go on to the other next nursing question. Sure. Connie is, um, she will be starting her I think starting her fourth year with us, um, she is a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. She's from um, the Louisa area. I think she's from actually, I don't know how to say the name of the city. Is it A-U-X-I-E-R? Sure. Okay. I think she's from that area or that's her maiden name or both or something like that. Um, <laughs> she has cows. Um, you'd never know it to meet her. Um, she's, uh, um, she teaches anyway, she's, she's in the, um, she will be teaching the first year skills lab. So all you first year students in the ADN program will have her for skills lab and in the fall. And then in the spring, she switches to second year and teaches the mental health nursing course. Good. Thank you. Uh -huh. Kind of looking around the room, I thought I'm, I'm couldn't remember who else we were forgetting, so I'll make sure we, we covered that as well. Um, and Janessa talked about the practicum and the hands-on experience, um, because experiential learning is part of all of our programs at the University of Pikeville, but these are unique because they are licensure programs. So, and there's different, different requirements there. So, um, I'll start with you, Dean Dameron. If you don't, if you don't mind, um, Ashley touched on the simulation and the equipment we had. So if you wanna go back and kinda, I almost brag a little, about our simulation and even our simulants and our patient simulator. I, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Hear okay. I, I, I couldn't hear you for a second. Okay. So, um, we, we actually at the University of Pikeville, we have some amazing equipment. We were very, very fortunate and had a several million dollar grant from uh, EDA, which is a federal thing, um, to purchase um, simulation equipment. And so, um, we have five high fidelity layered all simulators. We have the top of the line one. His name is, uh, well, we call him Sven. Um, he is a uh, Simman 3G. He's the Mac Daddy of the layered all simulators. He can sweat, his, eye, his uh, pupils can dilate and, con and uh, constrict. He uh, can simulate all kinds of um, different scenarios um, when Ashley works her magic on him. Um, so we have him, we have his brother, his name is Thor. Um, Thor is Simman trauma, so he can lose a leg and start spurting arterial blood everywhere if we want him to. Um, we also have Sim Jr. who is approximately an eight-year-old um, simulator, uh, does, uh, can do seizures, asthma attacks. We can adjust breathing and heart rate on him as well. Um, we can also have him do some certain uh, vo vocal things. Uh, we have Sim Newborn, um, which is a newborn uh, that can simulate all the different APGAR scores, um, actually turns blue around its mouth because of a LED light that's in the simulator. So it's kind of neat when the APGAR is very low 
as you would see in a newborn if somebody was born with a low APGAR score, which is a score that they get immediately after birth, um, they would be blue around the mouth. So, so is sim newborn. Sim newborn can simulate a number of um, conditions as well. And then we have sim mom, who is really, really messy, um, but she's amazing. She can simulate normal and abnormal births. Uh, we have two, uh, they're, they're not really high fidelity simulators, but they're better than mid fidelity simulators. They're called nursing and simulator that we like a lot. Uh, they were made specifically for nursing and they're very user friendly, whereas Sim Man's awesome, but he's, um, he's very technical. Um, and then we've got, um, I lose count because we've got so many of them. We've got about eight mid fidelity simulators that also have heart sounds, breast sounds, um, bowel sounds. The difference between like a mid fidelity and a high fidelity simulator is the high fidelity simulator is their, their chest actually moves up and down. And if you simulate a seizure, they actually jerk. Um, and like for example, Sim Man also um, sweats and Sim Man 3 tags that he can respond to these medications. Um, if you have the radio frequency tag for the medication near the simulator. So if I had a radio frequency tag for epinephrine, for example, connected to a syringe with saline in it, and I inject the saline into the SimMan 3G, his heart rate will elevate. And so will his blood pressure, just like a person's would with epinephrine. It's just saline, but the radio frequency tag is made so that it actually the simulator will respond to that pretend medication just like a human would. So he's pretty amazing. We have not used him to his fullest abilities yet, but we're, you know, we'll, we'll be moving that way in the future. We also own an ambulance. Um, it's an actual working, not working ambulance. I mean, not, we don't respond to <laughs> emergencies. I shouldn't say it's a working ambulance, but it does drive. I mean, it's an, you can get in it and drive it and, and put mannequins in it and we take that sometimes on the road to um, things where we're trying to recruit and then we, we share it with KICOM. KICOM uses it uh, to take out for their residents and stuff to practice with the simulators. It's a nice way to move the simulators because Sim Man, for example, weighs 80 pounds. So when we move Sim Man around, you have the choice of either loading him up and sticking him in your passenger seat, which he's $109,000, so we don't like to do that or we can put him on a stretcher and load him into an ambulance. And uh, last year, it was funny, um, Ashley and I took uh, Sim, Man, we took, who did we take Ashley? We took Sim Junior and we took Sim Ma, uh, no, Nursing and Simulator out on the road. And we had to leave really early in the morning and I had packed it up the night before. And so when I went out and we had moved the ambulance down to the CTC and I went out to get into the ambulance and I opened the door and I forgot that I had stuck nursing and simulator into the jump seat with the five point restraint. And so when I opened the door, <laughs> she said, I even yelled, it was funny, you know, it just startled me at, at first and I had forgotten that quickly that I'd stuck her in there. But uh, so we use that, you know, to, and we can also use it if we decide to do like a mass casualty simulation or anything like that. So we've got some interesting, we've, we're really, really fortunate in um, the amount of equipment that we have in our sim lab. So, and it's getting better. I can't give you all the details, but. Stay tuned, right? Stay, stay tuned, yeah, especially these new students coming in. You'll stay be tuned. seeing some big changes. Yeah, so clinical, um, now into kind of a little bit of a more difficult question. I, I know that students and families, um, students, students will be current and incoming students, or will be receiving a letter from our dean of students, and families of students will receive a letter from our president, hopefully this week, about um, detailed plans on our, the university's um, plans to, in response to COVID. Okay, so we know that's a fluid. We know no matter what state you're in or what region you're in, um, that changes daily, depending on the news and numbers, and we understand that. Um, and so I know faculty have been working since March, since we finished the semester um, under those restrictions, and we'll be having fall be different. We know that. So mm -hmm. one, one of the biggest questions for returning nursing students and incoming nursing students is clinicals. So, um, and that's based on 
hospitals too, uh -huh. and where, where you do those clinicals. So I know you may not be able to speak in specifics, but if I had a show of hands of our nursing students that are enrolling this fall, is that kind of one of your questions, what you're thinking about? The people that are with us today? Jessica's nodding, so for Jessica's sake. So what, what are you kind of... So right now, Stephanie, I can tell you that Pikeville Medical Center is open to students. Okay, so we have plans, <laughs> excuse me. They did close to us last March. They reopened to students in May. Of course, we haven't had any students in there <clears throat> since May. But um, they are open for students. We do have schedules with them pending for, for clinical. We fully expect to have in-person clinicals <clears throat> at the hospital. Um, so right now, that all depends on, and even if we, even if we go to different levels here at the university, our plan is to keep students in um, patient care areas, direct patient care areas, as long as we're allowed to by the facility. So we're kind of following the lead of PMC and other clinical facilities. We actually mostly use PMC in the um, fall. In the spring, we have some other clinical facilities that we use <coughs> as well for our psychiatric mental health um, clinicals, for example. So we will uh, basically, and we, we do, yes, we follow PMC guidelines that they use with their own staff. So for example, and I'll be sending out this information to the new students. For example, um, two weeks before we start school, it would be a really, really bad idea to travel to one of the hotspot states. Okay, so for example, I'm from Texas. I don't plan to travel to Texas in the next few weeks. Um, however, I might have to. My mother's in hospice. Um, if you travel to a <coughs> hot spot area, you could be quarantined for 14 days. So I'll be sending out all that information to the students as we get a little bit closer to that, that they need to not be traveling to hot spot areas. Um, isolation patients, yeah, not be plant, you'll not be assigned to isolation patients. Um, uh, the the um, email that you're getting from the Dean of Students today has some information for all students, not just nursing students. Temperature screening is going to be required seven days. There'll be a canvas um, like spreadsheet that you'll have to put your temperature on for an entire week before you come to campus. And yeah, they're also, Don Edda says, you're not doing clinical in the COVID unit. So don't worry about that. Um, so temperature screening seven days before we come back to, the, um, to campus and then testing five days before returning um, to campus. So I had a question today about the testing was, um, somebody had already had a COVID test and was negative, would that suffice? And the thing is, no, it won't. Yeah, Kelly is in a hot spot state, South Carolina. South Carolina, Idaho, Georgia, Texas, Arizona. Um, Florida. Florida, yeah. There's, so there's a few hot spot states. Now, Pikeville Medical Center re reserves the right to say, you know, if you went to Tennessee and they felt like Tennessee was a hot spot, they would have the right to say, we think it's a hot spot. We want you to quarantine. Okay. So just be aware of that. Wherever we are in a clinical facility, we have to abide by the, their employee rules. And I will be sending those out to the students as well as the faculty. So um, the one thing I did want to kind of jump in, if you don't mind, we've had, I've been in touch with several students that are coming from states where testing is back, back, backed up. So the testing, they have to have a negative, before students come to campus, they have to have a negative COVID test. Yes. So, and has to be within a certain amount of days. Well, they're, they're, the testing in their state is delayed so far by the time they got the result, it'd be outdated. So local testing is available. And then the letter you'll be receiving from Dean Owens today, it says to contact him and he can give you information about be how to be tested locally. So that test will be turned around in a quicker time frame. Is that correct, Dean Dameron? Is that what you've heard as well? Yeah, they're, they're gonna have one on campus that they can do. Um, it says, we have the ability to test you when you arrive, but you'll be quarantined and not able to enter campus immediately. So, 
Yeah. Um, if you guys don't mind for me to interrupt, me. there is a place in Pikeville, and I, I'll have to find out the name of that clinic, but it's down there located near Burger King in that area um, that has the 15 minute testing. Mm. So that might be an option as well. It's probably at that new urgent care thing. Yeah. It is, and I can't remember the name of it, Karen. I think it's, it's called urgent care. <laughs> I do. It's like right next to that Asia place. Yeah, it's over in that um, area there, but um, if I'm not um, mistaken, um, somebody. Thank you. So one thing I did want to mention that um, first year students would have class, um, first year students are scheduled to move in um, on the 19th if you're a true a freshman. Um, the night, this the Wednesday before the Monday classes start on the 24th, but watch your UPIC email, watch UPIC social media. The, if your official UPIC.edu account is how we communicate with you about all of these things, mm -hmm. anything of any importance that you need to watch. And I would recommend, especially this time of year, checking it, um, usually a few times a week, but I would check it every day because things does things do change um download the app on your phone all the information instructions on canvas um you can contact me you can just email me at family at upog.edu it's easier to remember family um and i can get that information to you but check your email often because depending on um testing and things like that and some the check it with distancing the move in move in um, procedure is going to look a little bit different than what it normally does and it takes just and we'll have appointments and things like that so just make sure when you talk about moving um check your check your email and check it often especially with communication from the overall university and from the college of nursing about specifics but the thing is we um any unknowns it's hard not not knowing and we feel like there's not enough information being shared but we share everything that we know at the, at, at the best of that moment. So, and that's with everything changing, we, we share it as soon as we can. So we want to make sure that everybody feels informed and we know everything, but make sure you make contact uh, with the people you met today through the chat. Um, with two o'clock, so I'll be respectful of everybody's time. Um, does anybody have any closing thing they want to make sure we say or any questions? I do not have a Okay. Uh, I was wondering, I want to, after I get become a registered nurse, I'd like to become a nurse practitioner and, and specialize in the endocology. What classes do I have to take? Um, I'll go, I can go ahead and answer, uh, answer that or give you uh, one of the responses. First, uh, before, um, as you get to specialize, when you come into the R, uh, RN program, you'll be exposed to many different areas, um, like the others were saying, obstetrics, older adults, you will go through oncology, you'll even do um, uh, psychiatric nursing. So you go through, I don't know, six or eight different specialty areas. And then in the end you get, so you don't specialize ahead of time, but then at the end you're prepared to take that license exam, the state board exam, which gives you your RN or registered nurse license. Then once you get that registered nurse license, then you can see about going on for a baccalaureate degree. Once you get your baccalaureate degree, then you can like specialize. Uh, many times nurse practitioners at a master's degree level, one step above. But during that whole time in the nursing program, it helps you as you go through all the different areas, you really start to see, hey, I didn't think of this before. I didn't know I was interested in orthopedics. Uh, and like I said, we do have oncology and you can say, yeah, that's really for me. But that true specialization will come after you get your, your registered nurse license. And then you can really zero in and almost narrow your focus into what you really want to do for your whole career, for most of your career. Oh, Others oh. Or, or any follow-up question, Josh, Joshua? Uh, I do got one follow-up. Uh, this ain't related to the investigation. It's just like about what like minors should I take? If I'm becoming a nurse. Well, minor you, you would take? Yeah. We find that, um, and some of the others pipe in here, what we find, um, we have different nursing students who sometimes double major, or while they're waiting to be accepted into nursing, 
they take courses in other areas. So many of them are in psychology, so it tends to be a helpful uh, if someone wants to minor. We have psychology, sometimes even get social work, take some beginning courses, communication. Uh, what others, um, other minors do we see, or if someone double majors, sometimes even biology, we see students um, take some courses. And so it's really very broad, but psychology, biology, and communication are big areas that nursing students might tend to minor in. Anybody else have any input? It's generally once you're accepted into the nursing program, there's not much time for a minor <coughs> unless it's already completed. So. I think this has been great. I think we've covered mm -hmm. a lot of information. Um, personally, it was great to see everybody and um, and touch base. Um, make sure you make notes, like I said, of the contact information in here and any any of the faculty that are here um, or will happily respond to your questions or point you in the right direction if they don't have the answer. Um, so just make sure you students check your email often. That's that's the biggest thing right now. And reach out and do not hesitate to um, reply to any of those emails and answer questions, ask any question that you have because we want to make sure that you're informed and you feel comfortable about coming back to campus or, or starting campus for the first time this fall. So I think we're good. I'm going to say over and out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.